Hey everyone, and welcome to episode 34. My name is Keshav and I'm the producer. Today's episode is with Rami Lee, who is an assistant professor of accounting at Ryerson University. Uh, she has an undergraduate, undergraduate degree from Western University in Arts and later went on to successfully pursue her CPA and Master's of Finance in Accounting. And she joined Sam to discuss a wide range of topics, but some of which include her path to becoming a CPA, how she got into academia, the evolution of the CPA profession as we're seeing it today, and how to strike a balance while completing your CPA and working in public accounting. So I think some of the topics that they discussed, whether you are you know, doing your undergrad in accounting or completing your CPA right now, um, both uh, can find a lot of value uh, in this episode. So take care and enjoy it. Good afternoon, Romy Lee. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Okay. Icebreaker question. When is the last time you ate a hot dog? Oh my gosh. Uh, a very, very long time ago. I couldn't tell you the answer to that. Not even, not even at a baseball game that I went to. Um, what was that you went to a baseball game? Uh, maybe, maybe a summer or two before the pandemic. Um, yeah, I, I, I will go and I will have fun at baseball games, not eat hot dogs and not have a clue what's going on in, in the game. Cause I don't really know how baseball works. <laughs> well, like, I, I feel like it's slow enough that like, you can kind of catch on to like when the fans are like cheering, you're like, yeah, so, like, absolutely. You can go and have a good time and not not eat a hot dog and not um, have a clue what's going on. It can still be fun. Um, were you about to ask me when the last time I've had a hot dog was? Uh, I think so, yes. Yeah, sorry to cut you off. Uh, yeah, I also can't remember. And I don't know if it would have been like a like a real hot dog or like a veggie dog or like, <laughs> it was probably like, I don't know, something with a bunch of like onions and a bunch of like cheese and something to disguise the fact that there was actually... <laughs> the mystery dog underneath okay well this podcast is off to a great start because um if you were like that is my go-to i'd be like i I don't know where to go from here Uh, all right romy lee how do we know each other i guess we know each other um through the education world um through working with uh CPA, uh, we got connected because you were, well, I guess you can clarify your, your role with, with the National Marketing Center, but, but I was kind of taking the lead on the Marketing Center for Capstone 2 for the assurance role. Uh, we were marking all those thousands of practice cases that students were were writing uh, during their capstone two module, and and I was co-leading that, uh, making sure that the whole marketing center went smoothly. And um, I guess we got in touch through through that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that would have been, gosh, we're like a couple months into the pandemic, so probably like I don't know, May, June, July, May, June, somewhere in there of twenty. 20, 2020. And yeah, we got connected. I was my second year of being at a National Marketing Center lead uh, for CPA Canada. And before then, um, and we'll get to your exact path, but before then, we were kind of like living these two like very parallel, parallel <laughs> lives, and but had no idea that each other existed. And like many things in the pandemic, there's you know happy accidents. And quite honestly, I want to highlight, I'm not usually big about talking about my myself on this, um, which is gonna be funny for people that know me in real life. But one of the reasons why I want to highlight this is because we were, you know, living these parallel things, doing very similar like lead roles. And then with the pandemic, your um, your kind of role was overseeing in person, um, you know, assurance marking centers for all of the day twos for Capstone 2 for all of the country. And then with the pandemic, there was all of a sudden no longer any in person. And so we had a strong um, track record from the year before, uh, from when I took over to say, hey, um, you know, Sam, can you either help out? Can you over, you know, help them transition? Can you, you know, figure out like how we're going to go online and what is that going to look like? So in a really, you know, pragmatic sense, uh, when we reached out to one another, it was very much like, 
it could have been, you know, for lack of better terms, like a pissing match, right? Where we're just trying to like, be like, no, I know this. No, I know this. And one thing I love about, you know, instantly talking with you is I felt like there was a rapport and neither one of us had to be like, oh, this is what I know, or this is what you should do. It was like, cool, we're in this together. How do we solve this? How do we, you know, make the best going forward? And um, I just want to say, I think that's really, really cool um, for being both two relatively young women in academia in the profession. Um, like I'm, I'm proud of us and I'm happy to share our story um, and, you know, and highlight you and your contributions to the profession. So first off, like, thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. <laughs> yeah, no, I think, and, and that turned into really just uh, an interesting relationship that we've had and bouncing ideas off each other and, and referring each other to different people. Uh, and I, I'm sure even after after this chat today, that, that relationship is going to stay there and we'll, we'll be able to just bounce ideas off each other as we, we both want to, to be, you know, good at what we do. Uh, and I know we're going to talk about that in a bit and creative and not just kind of complacent in our jobs. So I think we share that in common too. Um, so I'm excited for, for staying in contact in that way. Absolutely. It's funny. Um, I don't know when you first heard the term networking, like what was your initial reaction when people were like, Oh, Remy Lee, you should get into networking. Or, you know, when you heard that term, what was your initial kind of thought? Well, I guess I first started hearing about networking when I was in school, like under, like late in my un undergrad days, it was scary to me. You know, that's what I thought. Mm -hmm. um, super intimidating. Um, I thought I don't have anyone in my network. What do people mean? Like rely on your network. Um, yeah. And I know we tell students that all the time too. Like go to your network, reach out to people in your network to job shadow or to to learn about different opportunities. And I, that's what I was thinking is, is I, well, I don't have a network. How am I supposed to do that? Um, but you come to realize that you can start really close to home. Like just start with your immediate family members. Who do they know? Or who do, do their friends know? And you kind of work your way out that way. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's yeah. that's kind of what I think about. Yeah, when I think when I first heard it, it was in university, so similar. Um, and I thought of, oh, this is like where you wear your black suit, like you <laughs> you make sure your shoes are clean, and you go around and awkwardly like try to shake hands and like talk about yourself or something. So is that very like formal? And as I've kind of, I never knew when that like shifted uh, and evolved, but it would have been probably into my, you know, CA, like afterwards, after graduation, after complicating and kind of realized, wait a minute, networking is really just a synonym for relationships and being a decent human and helping without any expectation of, um, you know, reciprocity. And then when you need help, asking, you know, I love the fact that I can pick up um, my phone and text you a question about the competency map. And I love that, you know, there was a random day sometime when there was like a RevRec question from you. And I'm like, I love this. Like, this is, this is fun. <laughs> you know, so whatever people think about like networking, sure, it can be all of that. It can be, you know, asking your prof for advice or asking them if they know somebody about this or that, or, you know, reaching out to family or friends. But it can also just be like organically seeing cool people doing fun things and commenting and, you know, eventually just organically developing that relationship. So literally, yeah. You mentioned that um, you were an undergrad and I've kind of alluded to the, we've also talked about, you know, you being uh, involved in leading CPA marketing centers. So how did we go from one to the other? I'm going to be the uncreative podcast host and kind of ask you, what was your path to becoming a designated accountant? Um, well, actually, um, it was a little bit unconventional. Um, I actually, when, when I, when I mentioned undergrad, um, I didn't actually study accounting in, in undergrad. I studied social science. Uh, I majored in sociology and criminology and kind of had my, my thoughts on maybe going to law school, never even thought about accounting 
I had taken one business class, which was like an intro business class in undergrad, and that was it. And when I got close to the end of undergrad, I thought like this, this feels a bit weird. How have I not really taken more business? Uh, and I had, you know, some electives to spare. And it was really near the end of my undergrad that I took uh, a true accounting. It was intro management accounting and <sighs> financial accounting combined. And like when you talk about aha moments, I, I literally was just falling in love with the material. And you have to remember, I wasn't 18 at that point. I was closer to the end of undergrad. So I, I had a couple years. I had taken classes in all different spheres. And there was something about it I, I liked. So finished undergrad and then went back to school to take all the accounting courses that I needed to be eligible for the CPA exams. So that was my pathway. Um, I, I was under the old uh, pre-CPA converged uh, system. So I got my CA um, designation originally and I worked in assurance. Um, I worked in public accounting Then I moved into kind of more a bit of a consulting role um, outside of assurance and started, started teaching part-time, which kind of came to me. It wasn't really something I specifically looked for. Um, Ooh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna ask you about that because we have a number of people um, who, not like a huge, not like everybody, um, but some people are like, hey, I think I might wanna teach someday or hey, I mean, very rarely somebody's like, I want your job. And I'm like, oh, I'm glad it looks like a fun job because it is. Um, so how did, how did kind of the stars align where that opportunity kind of what it sounds like fell in your lap almost. Sorry, Sam, did you say rarely that people say I want your job or frequently? <laughs> to my face, my students, while they're in the middle of it, yeah. <laughs> they will occasionally say. Um, outside of my students, perhaps I hear it a little bit more often. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because I, I have a lot of students who say I could see myself in your shoes one day. Um, mm -hmm. It's one of the most common emails I get from students or prior students, and they want to chat about that. Mm -hmm. um, how did it fall? Kind of. Well, I exaggerated a little bit. Um, <laughs> I did. Um, <clears throat> well, I, I, as a high school student, um, even in, in undergrad, I always liked helping my peers and, and I did peer tutoring and uh, helping other students with kind of getting on their feet with studying and exams and that type of thing. Um, and when I was doing my accounting courses post undergrad, there was a course that I noticed that didn't have a tutorial leader. That in fact, the course didn't have tutorials, whereas other courses did. Um, so I don't know if everyone knows what I mean by tutorials, but kind of those optional outside of, of lecture sessions you can go to that are free, that are accompanying certain classes. Yeah, kind of like where they, quote, just apply. Like you're like, let's go through lots of examples and figure out why we're doing this. Like in how. And, and usually it's led by another student or a recent grad. So you can, the students can relate to them more. Yeah. It's not like, you know, the, the prof. Um, so I went to one of my profs and I said, you know, I loved your course and, and she knew me and I did well. And I would like to volunteer. You don't have to pay me to be a tutorial leader for your course. And I must have done that for like really a good number of semesters. And then she came to me and she said, you know, you're doing a great job. We wanna pay you for this. And so eventually I started getting paid for it. Nice. And then one day um, I got an email from the school and they said, we have an opening to teach a course and we know you've been around. Are you interested? And I said like, hell yeah, I'm interested. Yeah. So that, that's how it happened um, for me. Amazing. This is, I love like, stories and real life examples of making your own opportunities and not like perfect, you know, networking, not just with humans, but with institutions and, you know, just putting yourself out there without the expectation of, um, you know, anything in return. It goes around, comes around. And like, 
amazing to seek out, yeah, your own opportunities and make it work. So kudos. I, I will probably have to have another offline conversation with you about how to get people to your students to want your job. <laughs> Because I literally had one last week and she's amazing. I'm really looking forward to meeting with her more as she wants to know kind of more about my career path and how, um, you know, the different steps that she can take during her fourth year. But she specifically said, I'm really interested in the things that you've done, um, but I don't necessarily want to be a prof. <laughs> it's like, oh, it's fun, <laughs> like, but okay. So yeah, we'll have to meet and talk offline about that. So fast fast forward or maybe not fast forward. So were you doing, um, when you were teaching, um, is that at your current place of employment or was that a different university? Um, well, I started teaching at, at York University uh, and York University's accounting program uh, has classes in the day, but it also has classes in the night, very much geared for students who are working and going through the, the accounting courses part time. So I was working full time in my job in an accounting firm and teaching at night and it kind of grew and grew to teaching a bit more. Um, and I do still teach at York University, uh, but I also teach at Ryerson. Yes. So your current position, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, assistant professor um, of accounting at Ryerson University. That is correct. Nice. And what courses, you know, do you typically teach? Uh, well, I... I know, I know it'd be easier to say, which courses have you never taught? And then we could <laughs> probably just say like the one course, but... <laughs> Yeah, no, I teach uh, financial accounting um, at all different levels um, and I teach auditing and then I teach also um, ethics and leadership. Perfect. Yes. Um, and that is very consistent. It's kind of like you look at the evolution of the CA um, to the CPA and your experience in the firm and your kind of passion, your excitement, and you get to blend and make those opportunities and kind of get to apply it in several different courses because yeah, financial reporting is, um, is plentiful. Is there anything about your path between, you know, first, actually, I want to get the light bulb moment. What, what, do you remember a specific like aha, or do you just know that it was sometime during your uh, intro financial, intro managerial? I mean, I can tell you what the aha moment was, but it's to, uh, to others, it may not sound so aha, but uh, I was sitting at the kitchen table with my dad, who was explaining to me how prepaid expenses work. And when that clicked for me, mm. I was like, Oh my gosh. And I had the T accounts and I understood prepaid expenses. And, you know, it's for anyone that was listening to this who, who, who had a similar moment when they understood how accrual accounting works. <laughs> yes. uh, but for me, it was those prepaid expenses. I think it was like prepaid rent or something like that, that, that he was explaining to me. And I was just like, oh my gosh, this is cool. Like, I, I love this. And, um, and I couldn't wait to learn to learn more about it and just kind of see how the whole accounting cycle came came into place for me. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And I even more love that you remember because yeah. um, I don't necessarily remember my own, um, but I definitely do realize when I recalled like how debits and credits could both be equal and they must be equal. But how you get an income statement and a balance sheet, and the articulation. I was like, oh, it's, it's magic. And then, um, but still to this day, every time I get a uh, financial statements to balance, um, I get excited. And I feel like that's like part of the, part of the, I don't know, um, accounting gene, right? If you get excited when stuff balances. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, like, what are you all up to now with the pandemic? And, you know, has that increased or decreased your workload and involvement? I oftentimes students think, um, and I say this with love and kindness, but they, they see us teaching in front of them. And then they think that we go home and we prepare for the next time we teach in front of them or that we mark something for them. But there is often a lot more involved in the job. So, you know, how about you share perhaps um, kind of 
what do you all do now? Yeah, I think you made a good point. Students don't always know what we're doing outside of class. I mean, aside from sitting at my email, waiting for them <laughs> to ask me questions, um, I, there's a lot of, of, of admin work that, that goes on behind our teaching. Um, I mean, one of the things I spend a lot of time on is keeping up to date with what's happening in the profession, what's happening, mm -hmm. you know, even in my specific specific courses, like the accounting standards change, the audit standards change. So I have to keep up to date with that so that I can teach this, my students what, what's happening now, what's current. Um, serving on committees in, in the university, that takes up a lot of time too. You know, I we have a curriculum committee in the accounting department that I sit on. Um, I'm not anymore, but I used to sit on our university's academic integrity council. Um, lots of volunteer work out there in the community, serving on boards. Uh, a lot of boards look for CPAs because they're looking for that financial expertise. That takes up my time. Um, a lot of time spent on developing courses. So we're spending a lot of time uh, revamping courses so that they're better suited for the mm -hmm. online environment and developing materials for those. Um, yeah. A lot. And that's at, um, at, that's at the university, that's to stay current um, and university. And I include the community in there because I know at our school, like they, they love it and they expect it that we're going to be, we're not just, you know, in some tower somewhere, like we're out there with you know, our, with our quote users, you know, we're with our people, we're there contributing to our community. It's not just us and them, it's, it's, we're all in it together. Um, outside of that, you, um, one of our other parallels is our experience within professional education, specifically at the CPA level. Um, while, you know, during the pandemic, my time allocated to certain things has, has shifted, right? Um, there's, it's important for me to be part of the profession and the professional education, but it's that we're very fortunate that you can, you know, stay involved and it can mean, you know, several weekends a year and several, you know, modules at a time, or it can mean a little bit less. So I know for myself, I, you know, online facilitator, um, session leader, but now it's maybe once a year, maybe once or twice a year. Have you found a similar, I see you nodding. Yeah. Have you found a similar kind of uh, adjustment? Yeah, uh, and not not specifically because of the pandemic. Uh, if anything, the pandemic really should have made it easier to be more involved because we were doing so much mm -hmm. over Zoom. Uh, really, just my own schedule and and being busy. But but yeah, I think you make a good point. I, I like to stay involved, even if it's just once a year, um, just to keep up to date with with what they're doing. Um, and so the most recent module that that I taught was Capstone One, um, and I love Capstone One. It's just the integration of all of the the competency areas, the group work that's involved, the presentations. It's it's, it's such a cool part of the CPA journey. So I try to I try to stay involved in in that one at least every year. Yes, I. I agree and it's fun and you get students that did the graduate diploma in accounting sometimes uh, and then you get them that have started PEP from the beginning and then you kind of get this you get people that have done the electives um, in assurance and tax and PM and finance and you kind of get everybody together and it's this really exciting time where you know that they're going to write the CV in just a couple months so I, I echo your sentiment and my first and likely only um, workshop this year will be in May for Capstone One. And um, maybe I'll do uh, capstone two in the summer, but we're privileged in the sense that we can stay involved and we can know what's going on, um, but we can also maintain, I don't want to call it balance because it doesn't always feel like balance, but we can maintain that integration with the important parts of, you know, accounting education. I'm going to provide just a bit of background because sometimes our undergrads don't quite realize um, the CPA path and some of them, some of them do, but Oftentimes for your university, for my university, uh, when you come out with an accounting undergrad, you will have satisfied all the professional education, all of the PEP uh, prerequisite courses. 
And then you can start straight in the CPA quote modules or a graduate diploma or a master's program. And however you kind of go through that middle part, um, at the end, everybody has to pass the common final examination. And what's driving all of this is the competency map. So when we had our merger in 2014, uh, there's one map and the map drives the undergraduate kind of prerequisite material. This is what you need at entry, which is really what our undergrad courses map to. They tell you what you need at each level for uh, core and elective knowledge. And then the common final exam works off the map to ensure that you know, CPAs are demonstrating those uh, technical and enabling competencies in order to you know, become entry-level CPAs. Mm -hmm. So within all that, sometimes I really want to highlight the cool thing about um, you being involved in both undergraduate as well as graduate level at your university and CPA PAP, and same with myself, is that um, not a lot of educators do what we do. Like there's, there, we're not alone, like there's many, but there's not every, um, you know, every university prof doesn't teach in CPA PAP or doesn't have those ties. And, you know, most people in those PEP programs, you know, don't have those university ties. So what's cool about kind of in unique, and one of the reasons why I love chatting with you is I know that we understand the complexities of a post-secondary institution and professional education. And we understand that this map drives all of that. So with that, and a question popped up um, that in my mind, when you said that you have um, a sociology and criminology undergrad and looking at the announcement from March 1st uh, that came out about our map, our new competency map that'll be live in 2024, for, um, I notice a lot of kind of bigger thinking, um, and we don't have to get into it too, too much, but kind of big, big, juicy societal like discussions. Like we're, our profession is heading into such a way that, you know, accountants aren't going to be, can't be uh, accountants in a silo. So did you have any thoughts about the map? And you can take it in any map 2.0, any direction you want, societal, big challenges universities will take, uh, see any direction you want to take, Romilly? Yeah, I think um, I think it's amazing what they've done. Um, and I think it just goes to show that, that CPAs really have to be well-rounded. Um, the stuff that's in there, you know, with technology and sustainability and uh, knowing about uh, inclusivity issues and Indigenous views, it's I don't know that one, I, I mean, I guess there is some sort of ranking that they've assigned to the issues, but, but from a big picture view, I don't know that one's more important than the other. I think it's interesting that a lot of probably your listeners are, are going to be thinking, what does that stuff have to do with accounting mm. numbers, you know, and we think about the traditional financial statements. I think it's cool that we're, we're moving towards the, the non-financial stuff too um so yeah i think i think it's super interesting where where we're moving with all of this absolutely it's you know we're more than debits and credits we are not um you know that reactive we don't have to be i guess you maybe there would be that place if somebody was like i just want to sit in a corner, sit in a cubicle, do the same thing for the next 40 years there. I mean, that's, that's looking less and less likely, but there's possibly always going to be that. But then there's this whole other area that keeps opening and developing where we get to be a part of the conversation. We help shape the com conversation and we are forward looking as well as, you know, as well as reporting and our, you know, financial statements, statements, they're aimed to provide value to the users. This is part of it, the non-financial. It's not just a part of it, like it's probably the part of it. So I'm glad that we share the same sentiment there. And it's an exciting place for the future of accounting education and accounting in general. Yeah, for sure. So, okay, being a prof, how do you use accounting in your current gig? And we know that you have to stay current and we know that there's boards and community involvement, but like what other elements do you use accounting in your day-to-day -day life or day-to-day -day life work? You know, I think uh, accounting is like coming out of my ears because it's what I do all day. Um, 
in in my job but you know it's it's one of those things that it, it comes up in subtle ways with your friends and family people are asking you for advice can you do my taxes for me and and i can't because i'm not a tax accountant yeah. <laughs> i can barely do my own um you know and and financial advice or or you know just small things about can you tell me what do you think would be a better investment or mm. uh someone asks you something about their mortgage and maybe you don't know the intricacies of it, but it's all related to accounting. So um, I don't know, budgets, a lot of my friends somehow come to me and say, how, how should I budget? Mm. Um, and I say, well, that's like a really interesting question to ask because I, I, it's really a personal thing. It depends on how much you, you know, and, and clearly if you're asking that question, you really have, you really have no idea where to start. Um, so yeah, things, things come up, I would say, uh, related to my, my expertise as a CPA, kind of, kind of often. <laughs> I had a student tell me um, over coffee on Tuesday. He was so excited. He's my cost accounting class. And he's like, oh, guess what? We went on a road trip and I got to like calculate everybody's share of gas. And he's like, because there's two cars. So there's like different cost pools. There's different people. And we got them from different places. And, you know, I got, they asked me and I was like, absolutely. I know how to divvy this up in a, in a fair and equitable way. And I was like, yes, because what got exciting to me is that he was not only confident in his ability to do it, but he also wanted to share, which I feel is like, that's, that's kind of the accounting, um, you know, genetic component that we want to share. We want to help and we want to, you know, use our skills and use that. You do a lot of accounting. You do a lot of teaching. What kind of things do you like to do for fun, Romy Lee? Um, what do I do? Um, <laughs> trying to keep active, um, trying to get into the gym when I can, uh, love even just going on a really, really long walk, mm -hmm. winter or summer. Uh, it's been a really, really freezing winter, but I've just bundled up and I could do that, you know, every Saturday, every Sunday, probably go for a two hour walk, um, Absolutely. sometimes going into ravines or getting a bit more challenging with a hike. Um, yeah, playing tennis when I can. That's, that's fun. Yeah. That's excellent. I, I would never know. What's your favorite machine at the gym? I like the treadmill, but for yeah. walking. <laughs> yeah. Hey, no, it's, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> like a nice basketball. <laughs> like, yeah. Or incline, incline's always nice for the calves. Yeah, totally. Uh, I, I used to be intimidated by all those machines, but I've, I've, I've become accustomed. And I, if someone shows me how something works, then I'm, I'm comfortable and I'll use it. Nice, I like that. It's, um, I find there's a lot of parallels uh, between being an educator and then being a learner and then being able to translate it back and forth. And, and during, like during my master's, one of the, in education, um, so I know you have a master's in finance and accounting. So I'll be circling back to that. But when I was doing my master's in education, one of our activities was to go out and do something that we hadn't done before and document the process. And it was, uh, I did yoga, yoga silks, like, uh, the aerial yoga. And I remember like being nervous, documenting, having the person be so kind and so like, you know, bring you through the baby steps and just what it felt was like they were opening up and just being like, hey, it's okay. And hey, this is what you do. There's some baby steps and then there's, you know, the progression and, you know, really being able to document that and experience. I feel like I took that back to my teaching practice. So when you talked about, as long as somebody shows me how to use it, I'm comfortable with doing it. I'm like, that is likely <laughs> somehow woven into your teaching practice. Is, is that, am I off base? No, you're, you're on base. I, I didn't even realize that's what I was saying, but you're, yeah, you're totally right. <laughs> Sorry. It's just, yeah, I like, yeah, the parallels. So tell me, when did you, amongst all of this, when did you have time and like, how did you get your, your master's and how was that process? 
So I did uh, my master's kind of around the time I was leaving public accounting. Um, and actually, my master's was in something called financial accountability, um, oh, uh, which cool. is all centered on governance and ethics and, and really just um how boards should be should be more accountable. Um, it, the program was was spawned after the two thousand eight financial crisis. Um, so yeah, that was that was a really cool uh, cool program to be part of. And uh, I did it bit by bit, and uh, was kind of still working a little bit on the side, and and made it happen. And I think it's it's really different when you do your masters once you've worked for a bit and you've been out of school and and you go back to school because you really want to learn as yeah. opposed to I have to get this undergrad degree because without it I'm you know gonna have a really hard time finding a job so when you want to learn and I remember just being so eager to go to my classes like I was always there early I was the one sitting in the front row participating my hand up was going on up for every class question um yeah that was me <laughs> I love it we need to go to a conference together because that is how I conference when there's like the sessions I want to go to I'm like front row center and I'm like oh, what's what this <laughs> I think we'd have fun interesting so I had a student and they just emailed me so I'm gonna be thinking about it and reply back to them we are in it's March 11th we're recording this so we are like towards the end of busy season but we're in the thick of this this is a recent grad and he's, you know, just finished his first mod in the fall and he's in the middle of busy season at a firm. And he, like they asked, how do you find like a balance or what is, what are your thoughts on balance um, while articling? So maybe this is me being lazy or efficient, but I, I, it's more, I just want to be thoroughly researched and not lead lead them astray. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? You know, especially given that we both been there, done that, and we both done, you know, working in our masters later. So what are your thoughts? How should I advise them? <laughs> well, I think they say that you should be putting in about 15 hours to 20 hours minimum a week when you're working through those pet modules. Uh, I think the reality is you probably need more than that. Mm. So when you think about that, how do you how do you find that time? You know, even if you spent, let's say, seven hours Saturday, seven hours Sunday, uh, and, and that's not enough, uh, plus then you're working all week, it's it's tough to get through it. I think probably the best advice I would give someone is to speak to whoever you're reporting to, you know, your senior, your manager, and, and let them know that you're, you're completing this. Um, well, that is, as long as you're not going against firm policy, because yes. some policy, some firms say, you're, you, you, we don't want you to be doing these modules during busy season. Um, but I would, I would speak to, to whoever, you know, you're reporting to, because as you say, we went through it, they went through it, they, they will hopefully understand and try to set some boundaries. Um, and the best thing I would say is, is to a student is to try and do, I'm not saying every day a week, I think that's, that's going overboard, but try to spread it out. Just like, you know, you might tell someone, try to do exercise four days a week or five days a mm -hmm. week, rather than just go crazy at it two days a week. Um, because that way, if you start early in the week and you think about it a little bit by bit, it, it's kind of in the back of your mind. And as you're doing other things, you're thinking about it rather than trying to cram those assignments at, at the last minute before they're due. Oh, I love that. And I love um, that that tracks directly with like with the learning science, right? It's your subconscious is amazing and it's powerful. So yeah, it, and you, it'll just keep percolating back there. And especially without the stress, like if it's not five hours before the deadline, your brain is actually allowed to like work while you do on other things. And then you also um, kind of utilize the primacy and recency bias that the stuff that you do at the beginning of session and the stuff you do at the end of the session will stick in your memory and actually go you know, through REM and go to your long-term so that you're not trying to sit down and, and cram because like, Romy Lee, I am, I know we both love accounting. 
you know, so I have a back and forth sometimes, sometimes I'm like, I love it as a tool. And then other times I'm like, debits and credits. But um, anytime, even at like my height, if somebody was like, sit down for seven hours and study accounting, I'd be like, no. Yeah, absolutely. I tell my <laughs> students that all the time. <laughs> like that's you awful. You cannot spend one night a week on your homework for my class. Mm -hmm. um, it, I, you just can't, and you can't study. You know, a lot of the time students will say, I cannot understand why I didn't do well on the exam. I spent five days leading up to the exam yeah. studying, and I'm thinking, well, you're, you're looking at that as if that's like this big accomplishment. Wow, you spent five days. And I'm thinking, no way, that's not going to work. You have to do it in little chunks um, because it all, it all builds. So I think that's true in university. And I think it's true when you're going through the PEP program too, for sure. Yeah. Okay. And then just sticking on that, like kind of how do you survive during PEP? What about if a student is in the middle of their busy season and they aren't taking a module, but they're working 50, 60, 70 hours. And they're kind of like in that, I don't know about you, but I would have trade-offs between do I eat like dinner, shower, or sleep more? And like, <laughs> and you could do two, but you couldn't do all three. Um, how do you, like, what would you recommend to them as far as how to stay sane or how to stay balanced or like how to manage through that process? Yeah, it's so tough. Um, and I, I mean, to a degree, I experience that that even now, you know, when I have so yeah. much on my plate, and I have to make those trade offs. I think um, things connect to each other. And I think one thing that is really, really important, you started off asking me about hot dogs, don't eat that kind of food, like, lay off the, the heavy, greasy carbs, really because it creates brain fog. And, mm. and I think when you eat clean and you eat healthy, then you're not gonna have those cravings and you're not gonna feel low on energy. And it's all, you, you're just gonna feel healthier. You're, you're gonna be able to sleep better. You're gonna need a bit less sleep. You're gonna be able to wake up early. Um, and, and it's all gonna just help you to have that healthy lifestyle. Um, when you know when you're trying to get through that busy season i think you you, you so you got to eat pretty good um and get some fresh air i i think that ah. helps too like even if it's 10 minutes and then 10 minutes later in the day i mean you have to be able to take 10 minutes and, and i know what do people usually do when they need a break they're reaching for their smartphone to go on yeah. social media so yeah. if you need to do that while you're walking for 10 minutes outside and getting fresh air. And that's going to rejuvenate you. Um, those would be my tips, I guess. I love that. Get outside, see the sun. Because there was one time where it was four months before I saw sun, right? <laughs> you go to work and it's dark. You come out and it's dark. And I'm like, why? And it's just so powerful. It's a small, small things, really, that are the big things that create those positive spirals. Thank you. A good yeah. reminder. To, to all of us, not just the students. So what are you about your future plans? Like, what are your plans? What options are you considering? Uh, Career-wise, I guess you're asking about. Whatever yeah. direction you want to take it. Um, I don't know. It's something I think about from time to time. Um, I'm definitely a proud CPA. Um, and I, I don't see myself doing something completely uh, that doesn't make use of, of my CPA. Um, something that, I, I don't know, I'm pretty interested in, you know, what, what CPA uh, is doing with, with the education for students, maybe working on that side of things, um, maybe working with the standards and, and drafting standards, developing standards, looking at how they should be changing. Um, I think that's pretty interesting. Um, maybe doing some, some research, um, which I'm kind of a little bit involved in now with, uh, looking, you know, at how, how our future CPA students could be more ethical, um, and doing some research on that. So maybe other kind of accounting education research merged projects. 
<laughs> I love it. I love it. And it's so cool that, you know, with one designation, really like, yes, it is hard. Uh, but part of the reason it's worthwhile is because it's hard. Uh, and so with one designation, there are so many paths that you can continue to open up for yourselves. Uh, and just like our students, our future grads can do the same. Yeah. Any regrets about completing your CPA? I have zero regrets. Um, zero regrets. I, I cannot... I don't know. I'm, I'm so thankful for, for just, you know, we talked about my pathway and how things kind of came my way. And I mean, I also think back to my involvement with PEP that kind of happened a little bit sporadically too. And, and I almost missed the boat to be involved in CPA PEP and I have no regrets. I I'm happy with what I'm doing. Um, I love teaching, I love working with students, and I think the CPA really just, every, everyone says, you know, that textbook answer, it opens so many doors for you. And, and I really think I'm living proof that it does. It opens so many doors for you. Um, how about you? I'm curious, do you have regrets? <laughs> no, because it's it's really been the foundation and it's, I think I've had like three careers based off of one designation. Yeah. And it'll be interesting in five or 10 years uh, when people perhaps take a look at, you know, my education and they're like, oh, well, you were, you know, quote, the traditional academic, right? You have all like the degrees or whatever, you look like that. But then when you kind of look at your CV, my CV, you realize, wait a minute, we got our foundation, we got our base. And then we pursued from that base, our interests. And when we needed to, you know, got the masters or we, you know, further that with research, but we didn't, we didn't do it in the sense that, oh, I'm going to do research and then get this job. I'm going to do X and then get this job. It's like, no, no, we got that job. And then within that job, we did cool stuff with fun people and we created our own opportunities. And when necessary, you go get uh, another degree or you go, you know, um, explore some research aspects or you go to a conference or you go then versus, you know, using the same mentality that people do undergrad. Oh, I'll get this degree and then I'll get the job. Like, mm -hmm. no, once you actually get out there working, degree, CPA, it opens the doors, you walk through them. You have the skills that people will trust that you can do, um, that you can learn how to learn. And, and any additional learning, they know that you'll go off and do that. So zero regrets. I also kind of, I don't want to say got lucky, but there's a lot of like good fortune in the sense that, you know, when you're in your early 20s, <laughs> you know, the decision making based off the amount of information you have there has to be some like good fortune and good timing in there. And yeah. that's part of the reason why we're doing this is like to show people that there are these really good opportunities. And if people resonate with something in your story or my story or another guest story, they're like, oh my gosh, like that's a door I want to walk through or I want to know how to get there. And it's kind of like, cool, go do that. Cause I just kind of stumbled around until I found some cool stuff. Yeah, totally. I, I, I don't know about you, but I have not spoken to many, if any, CPAs who say they regret it. There's certainly CPAs who go a bit of a different route yeah. um, and they say, I, I could have ended up doing what I'm doing without it, but they, I, I don't think I've heard somebody saying I regret it. it if anything, it's on your list uh, of personal accomplishments. Like going through those CPA exams, it, it's it's grueling. And if you can get through that, and I mean, you see uh, around the time of year when when people uh, get notifications that they've passed the CFE, it's all over your LinkedIn feed because everyone just feels so so proud of it. You know what you went through. I I don't think anyone could take that that away from you. So it's. Yeah, it's, it's really a respected designation and it's one I would tell a student if you're not sure, if you're on the fence, go for it and, yeah. and then you've got it and you don't know what's ahead of you in life and, and you'll have those letters behind your name forever. Absolutely. 
uh, this, the question was put in there um, from one of my former students. And I think um, he's really interested in hearing all my guests answer. <laughs> just, she's like, just in case. But yeah, it's like, you don't, you, it's, yeah, people know what you went through. You don't have to use it, but it's absolutely a part of our story. And it's, it's pretty cool. So how do you know, and maybe I'm asking for my own interests, um, how do you know when it's the right time to move on from your last job or role? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I think when you feel that that plateau happening, uh, you've learned a lot, you've gained a lot, but you feel like that that challenge is not there as much and you're kind of just going to work and doing what you need to do and it's not exciting anymore, that, then you know probably it's the time to move on. Like when things aren't hard anymore, when you don't have that little pit in your stomach of, uh-oh, how am I going to do this? Or I don't know the answer. When you know everything, it's probably the time for a new challenge. Perfect. Couldn't agree more. Do you have any books or podcasts that you'd recommend for other current students, recent grads, or articling students? Um, well, i uh, I, I, what I would recommend on a related note, mm -hmm. um, I think um, getting, getting a subscription to The Economist or, or getting access to it through, through the school it is probably one of the biggest things I would recommend. Um, I, I have it on, on my phone and, and I read kind of the mini version of the news. It's called espresso through the economist every day. It's kind of cool. Cause I drink my espresso while I'm reading the espresso. Um, I love it. And, and it's, it's a great way just to get the morning brief of kind of what's going on in, in the world. And I, I think sometimes accounting students don't realize the connection between what's happening in the world and with politics and with accounting. And believe it or not, that connection is there. And I'd, I'd probably challenge your listeners to, to go and think about what that connection is. Um, so yeah, I would recommend that. Um, it's not a book, but I have a magazine to recommend and that's the CPA Pivot magazine. It, it's kind of one of my favorite things to see coming in in the mail. And it's, it's a light read. Uh, you, you know, you get some of the updates happening in the profession and related and in business. And I think it's, um, I think it's a great kind of, I, I have mine. Right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's, it's just a, a way to keep up to date without, you know, necessarily having to read a whole book if you don't have time for it. Perfect. No, I thank you. Um, before we kind of go into our last question, I know we're, we're running up against the clock. Uh, do you have any other advice for any, any of your students, any of my students, um, just, just in general, we covered a lot. I know there's a lot of great things in here, but any kind of closing advice pieces? Best advice I, I would tell our students, and, and maybe they've heard this already, but, but repetition is always good, is, is for students to make sure that they're digitally upskilling themselves. Mm. Um, I mean, I think at this point, Excel is a given. Like you need to know how to use Excel. And I'm almost talking about more than just the basic basics. Um, that, that's, that's a given. Uh, learning about analytics, um, not only how to do it, but how it's relevant, how you could use it in, in your job wherever you end up. Learn how the profession is changing. Uh, learn how it's, how it's relevant in today's landscape. And... Don't wait to find a job. Job hunting is tough and it is competitive. And we started off talking about networking. So our students should be networking in whatever small way, uh, starting like yesterday. 
Yeah. You know, it, it's never too late to to be networking. And and I, I hate to see my students in fourth year that are saying, can you give me some advice? I haven't really started looking for a job. And I'm thinking this is something you you should have been on to a year or two ago already, you know, getting your resume in good shape, thinking about volunteering opportunities and leadership opportunities and networking so that you, what it, I mean, it's the best feeling. Anyone listening who knows they're about to graduate and they've already got a job secured or they're close to it, it's a great place to be in. Yeah, the best time to be networking um, and to be kind of getting those up skills, you know, um, really smoothing out that resume, polishing up that resume is when you don't need a job, right? So uh, I was a hockey game last night um, with some firm folks and they are already starting to probably look to fulfill roles for September 2023 in the coming months. So, you know, this is, this is the landscape. There's, you know, employers that are kind of out there. There's you that are out there trying to meet that demand, um, upskill, polished, network be be an awesome human um and it's it's a fun gig right going out and talking to people about accounting about yourself about them like it's it's pretty pretty fun romili yeah. how would you define success um i think I, I think the biggest thing when you think of success is is don't don't compare yourself to other people Set your own goals, uh, set your own time frame um, of, of the period that you think you can accomplish things in and, and go for it and accomplish those things and, and you'll feel proud of yourself. Don't worry what, what other people are doing or what they think. If you accomplish your own goals within the time period you plan to, then, then you are successful in, in your own eyes. Love it. Love it. Romy Lee, if students want to get a hold of you, they want to send you a quick note or they want to send you a big note, um, would it be okay if I linked uh, to your LinkedIn down below in the description? Yeah, that would be awesome. And I am totally open to speaking to anyone who's interested in, in chatting to me about the CPA profession or just getting some advice about career stuff or job stuff or school stuff. Um, you know, sometimes it's nice to kind of just reach out to someone that you have no connection to at all and, um, and just get some totally objective advice or insights and I, I'm happy to always discuss with with anyone that would like to. Perfect. Thank you. On a personal note, I just want to say it is always quality over quantity um, for the people in my life that I really look forward to talking with. And I'm so, I'm so thankful to have met you and I'm looking forward to, you know, continuing on this conversation offline uh, for the years to come. So thank you for coming on. Awesome. Thanks for having me.